Cities are the supreme expression of our civilization, magnets for the ambitious and for the enterprising. As hotbeds of innovation, their architecture constantly evolves to meet the changing needs of society. For hundreds of years, British towns were built behind high defensive walls, their commercial centers crammed into a tiny space with people's shops and houses built of timber jutting out, creating narrow and winding lanes. But 300 years ago, there was a major change in the way our urban spaces were designed. From this to this. This is the moment in the story of British architecture when our cities became orderly and elegant. It's a tale of dodgy property deals, high society marriage markets and low-life criminals. It tells of our national union and takes us the length and breadth of the country. This is the story of the birth of the modern British city. Britain's urban transformation starts here, in our capital city. London has always been the economic dynamo behind Britain's success. But I think in the 17th century, something very important happened here. The incredibly rapid development of the capital started to influence the design of towns and cities across the country. But that urban revolution couldn't begin until our political revolution was over. In 1660, shortly after the death of Oliver Cromwell, the British monarchy was restored. After 15 years of Cromwell's dour rule, the glamour of Charles II's court was intoxicating. People wanted to be as close as possible to the merry monarch. The rich, the famous and the fashionable all wanted to be close to the royal court at Whitehall. So they moved west and created a whole new quarter of London that today we call the West End. And they wanted to live in a very similar sort of house. They wanted to live in big, plain, modern, light and airy houses, which crucially had to look out onto a square. Up went Hanover Square, Berkeley Square, Leicester Square, Cavendish Square. The list goes on and on. Here in St James's Square, I'm in one of the earliest of the big West End developments. This was such a fashionable place that it even housed one of the king's mistresses. Westerly winds blew the city's grime and pollution eastwards, keeping these exclusive suburbs clean and healthy. Squares went on to become one of the defining features of our capital city. And in fact, today, London boasts at least 600 of them. The King may have been the main attraction, but London's smart new suburbs were being built on private enterprise. Leading the way was Britain's first real property speculator, Nicholas Barbon. In a drive to maximise profits, Barbon pioneered a new housing design, the Terrace, a row of identical, separate homes that could be built cheaply using prefabricated materials. The son of a Puritan preacher, Barbon had not inherited many Christian scruples when it came to business. He was involved in dozens of dodgy deals and happy to swindle his investors even from beyond the grave. When he died in 1698, he left a will directing that his debts should never be paid. But the terraced house lived on. It's still one of the most common city dwellings, with 18 million of us living in them today. In fact, we rate the design so highly, we even think it's good enough for our prime ministers. After the restoration, the West End became a playground for the super rich. And they embarked on a spending spree that made London into the shopping capital of the world. I've come to Berry Brothers and Rudd on St James's Street, a great example of a 17th century shop that's still going strong. <laughs> I've always wondered, is this actually the oldest continuously operating shop in London? We think it is, yes. Certainly the one in which a family has continued to trade for over 300 years. 
Berry Brothers and Rudd is one of the earliest surviving examples of a glass shopfront, a design which dominates our high streets today. You're famous now for being wine merchants, mm. but you weren't famous then for selling wine. No, absolutely not. I mean, the first goods that we were famous for selling were the most expensive drinks of their day, not wine at all, but tea and coffee. When this shop was first opened, who do you think the customers were? Well, the customers were at the court. It was a corner shop, effectively, <laughs> um, for all of these, all these courtiers. But the great and the good didn't just come here for coffee. They also took advantage of the coffee scales Berry Brothers used to weigh their stock. It was one of the vainest parts of British history as far as clothes were concerned. And they were also beginning to go on diets for the first time, so it was important for them to come down here and sit on these scales and get themselves weighed. Everyone who was anyone had their weight recorded in the bound leather ledgers. We began to weigh people in 1765. People like Pitt the Younger, the Duke of Wellington, the Prince Regent, but more recently than that, Lord Byron, a man obsessed with his weight, I might add. Lawrence Olivier, indeed, a few days ago, we weighed Kevin Spacey here. And now, it's my turn. Oh, goodness. Oh, yes, I have a sinking feeling. <laughs> we have lift off. I'm a balanced character for a change. <laughs> 11 stone, 8 pounds. A little heavier than Lord Byron, but a lot lighter than Kevin Spacey. Place in history. <laughs> An explosion of building, shopping, cheap credit and free enterprise transformed London into the largest city in Europe. But the capital's new residential areas had not grown up according to any overarching vision or master plan. It wasn't in our booming capital city, but in a provincial spa town that a unique set of circumstances came together to allow the architectural ideas that had been born in London to create a truly grand planned city. Amid the rolling hills of Somerset, on the banks of the River Avon, the Romans built a town round Britain's only hot spring. Thirteen hundred years after the Romans left Britain, Bath was a sleepy provincial town. But suddenly, around 1700, it was catapulted into the centre of British architectural innovation. Bath took on where London had left off and showed the world what was possible with town squares and terraced houses. Its success was down to three factors uniquely combined in the 18th century. The fashionability of the hot spring, architectural innovation, and money, lots of money. And it was all started by the genius of one man, the architect and entrepreneur, John Wood. John Wood was the son of a local builder. He was born in Bath, but trained in London and saw the Great West End squares emerge. By the time he returned here in 1727, he was ready to improve on what he'd seen. As soon as he comes back from London, he has this vision of building a monumental classical city as a sequence of public spaces. And the great challenge of his life is how do you do that by putting up little terraced houses on spec? Wood stole an idea that had been unsuccessfully tried in London's Grosvenor Square. He cunningly designed a terrace of houses to look like a palace. This is the first palace front in Britain. It's the first time someone is able to get seven craftsmen to put up houses and pay for grand Corinthian columns, fancy door cases, lovely mouldings around the windows. When you step out of your doorway, you're stepping out of a palace. So it enabled you, if you weren't particularly rich, to give the impression that you are living in the house that only a, an aristocrat could afford? Yes. Wood, the self-proclaimed restorer of Bath, built a city fit for a Roman emperor. And whilst town squares were nothing new, he went on to build a grand terrace in a circle. The circus really was innovative, wasn't it? Yes, it's the first in the world. It's the first time someone put houses in a circle. 
And it's also incredibly successful. William Pitt, the Prime Minister, is just one of the first people to buy houses here. The Prime Minister moving in puts the social seal on its economic success. Yeah. But perhaps the most famous of Wood's designs was built after his death by his son in 1775. It is, of course, the Royal Crescent. The Crescent has a worldwide impact. When they start to draw up the plans of Washington, D.C., you can see them looking at Bath in this concept of buildings facing this open green space. It's this idea that the city can be flung open to the landscape. 18th century art and literature romanticised the countryside. King George III even built a farm at Windsor Castle so he could play at being a farmer. Pretty soon, rich townsfolk wanted the urban environment to feel much more rural. This is so much grander than even the houses in the circus, isn't it? Yes, the people who bought these houses, they could have bought uh, a country house. In some senses, that's exactly what they were trying to buy, wasn't it? I suppose they had the best of both worlds. They lived in Bath with all its pleasures, but when they looked out of their windows, they had exactly the same view as someone in the country house. That is, a beautiful rolling landscape running down to the river, grazed by sheep and cattle. So they even put sheep and cattle on it to try and give the feeling that they were in the countryside, although they were in the middle of a really sophisticated town. Yeah, and on a summer evening, you would have seen smartly dressed women in their fancy skirts strolling between flocks of sheep. And so it was really a sort of turning point in the way people regarded the city. It's here that the city is opened up to the countryside. Throughout the 18th century, Bath was considered the most beautiful city in Britain. But then, nowhere else had its natural advantage, Bath stone. An abundance of local stone gave Bath's buildings a unique and stylish uniformity and an intimate link to the landscape. Engineer Ed McCann is on a mission to find out why Bath stone was such a successful building material. And his first stop is a working mine. For all their grandeur, Bath's buildings start off down here. And I'm all kitted out and prepared to go underground to see where Bath's famous stone is won. Bath stone was first quarried by the Romans, but it really came into its own in the 18th century when Bath grew to become the eighth largest city in the UK. In Georgian times, they ripped about three million tonnes of this stuff out of the ground to build Bath and places like it. And of course, in those days, mining and quarrying were very dangerous activities and lots and lots of people died. That's a bit poignant for me, actually, because my grandfather died in a quarry accident about 50 years ago. Fortunately, though, mines are much, much safer now. Bath stone is plentiful and relatively soft, making it fairly easy to extract, even back in the days when they did it by hand. And the next stage of the building process is still sometimes done that way. Oh, hi there. How do you do? Nice to meet you. Traditional stonemasons Peter and Paul Bloomfield are going to show me how they cut and carved stone back in Georgian times. And so how are you going to cut this? With a saw. You are joking. Nope. This is rock. Yeah, I don't have any machinery, so I still cut it with what we call a frig bob. <laughs> I've got to see this. <laughs> well, this is a frig bob. A frig bob. A frig bob. That is one serious saw. <laughs> right, so can I have a go then? Go on. As you're a frig bob version, I'll, I'll get the saw started. <laughs> And how long would it take you to get through that, then? Well, um, I would say about ten minutes. It's astonishing. Yeah. Sorry, which yes. hand goes on top, does it matter? It doesn't matter. Whichever is most comfortable for you. <laughs> it's all about keeping it smooth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like anything, it takes... <laughs> well, at least I'm not a frig bob yeah. virgin anymore. Bath stone can be sawed or squared in any direction, making it particularly good for the intricate decorative work displayed on buildings all over the city. But it was not always to everyone's taste. Now, this looks very, very soft to me. And I've heard that uh, the good people of London in the 18th century used to say that Bath stone was like mouldy, maggoty old cheese. Well, I've heard rumours also that uh, the quarries in the Bath area, sent their locks up to them <laughs> and kept their best for themselves. Ah, which is... that, that would explain a lot. <laughs> yeah. A good quality Bath stone is not soft but easy to work. OK, 
can be sawn, it can be chiseled, and it can be fashioned into virtually any shape you want for a building. So an architect's dream and a mason's dream. And then we have one lintel for bath. This is Pryor Park, home of stone merchant Ralph Allen. Allen was the man who first made bath stone fashionable. Now, this is uh, pretty impressive, isn't it? Why has he done this? What's the purpose of this? Well, we've got Bath down there, and Bath can see this great house built of Bath stone. It's, in effect, an advertisement. So he can be seen from Bath, he can be seen by the visiting gentry. And they get to see this and go, I'll have one of these then, please. Exactly, and I'll have it built of Bath stone. So Ralph Allen was the Charles Saatchi of his day, but his ingenuity didn't stop with advertising. He was also pretty good at getting his product to market. In 1727, he helped make the River Avon navigable. Next, he built a horse-drawn railway across his land. He's got his quarries up on the hill behind this great house. He then builds a railway down the left-hand side of this coombe, which links up with his mason's yard down by the river. It was one of the earliest railways in the south of England, but very important in the history of uh, technology. He has a very artful idea, too, regarding his employees. He decides a way of making money is to pay them less. And the question is, how the hell did he get away with it? <laughs> well, he got away with it by providing them with very good quality housing. Furthermore, he gives them year-round employment. The guilds, of course, in Bath might have had views on this, which is probably one of the reasons why he established these workshops well outside the city. <laughs> and, of course, all of this reduces the price of Bathstone and therefore makes it even more saleable. He's actually quite an operator, isn't he? He certainly is. He's a prototype industrialist and, in the process, put Bathstone on the map. <laughs> if Bathstone was the perfect material for a grand city, the perfect style was classical. Society in 18th century Bath was obsessed with classical architecture, that's to say, architecture based on ancient Rome. And this fashion, this fad, was fed by an almost insatiable desire for the rich and the aristocracy to travel abroad to Italy, mainly to see firsthand for themselves the extraordinary archaeological discoveries, like the excavation of Herculaneum. And when they came back, they bought books, books of patterns and designs and elevations of the ancient buildings that rested on every coffee table in Bath. When the Georgians had pretensions of grandeur, they usually looked to ancient Rome for inspiration, recreating one of the most magnificent civilizations the world had ever known. For anyone with a classical education, the inspiration behind John Wood's circus, or Royal Circus, as it was called originally, would have been fairly obvious. It was a Roman amphitheatre. But there was one difference. With a Roman amphitheatre, the columns would have been on the outside. So, yes, we have here an amphitheatre, but it was inside out. The detailed handling of these great facades was also inspired by the Roman amphitheatre in the way that the three orders of columns here adopted a Roman hierarchy. So you've got on the bottom the lowest, the toughest, the most solid of the Roman orders, the Doric, supporting a big, heavy carved frieze. Above that, slightly lighter, this is the Ionic order with its wonderful carved volutes in the capitals. And on the upper level, you have the Corinthian order, the grandest and most elaborate of the three. And between each of the coupled pairs of columns, you can see the way there are swags of fruit and flowers. And in the middle of each one, the head of a cherub. This whole grand conception is directly based on the architecture of ancient Rome. So who exactly were all these new houses being built for? By the middle of the century, Bath was Britain's most fashionable holiday resort, and every social climber in the country flocked there to mingle with the elite. Social historian Stephen Parisian is paying a visit to Bath's assembly rooms to find out about its high society heyday. I'm here to get a sense of the sort of people who were attracted to Bath in the 18th century, during which time the population of the city rose from 2,000 to 30,000 people.
These marvellous assembly rooms were designed by John Wood the Younger in 1769 for lavish balls, for gossiping, for gambling, for assignations. This was the place to see and be seen. Bath's success as a social mecca was largely down to the legendary dandy Richard Beau Nash. The self-proclaimed king of Bath, Nash arranged the city's social life. He organised balls, concerts, promenades, he set the trends in fashion and he established a strict code of behaviour. He even successfully banned swearing. Nash's greatest achievement was to get different classes of people mixing together. Before his arrival, the nobility, the gentry and the merchant classes didn't socialise with one another. What Nash did was to establish common meeting places and a strict routine that was followed by all. Taking the waters in the pump room at nine o'clock. Promenading on the parade at 12 o'clock. Dancing and gambling in the assembly rooms from 6 p.m. Friendships were being created across the social divide in a way they wouldn't have dreamt of in London. Bath was becoming a platform for social change. Not only were public buildings required for socialising, public pavements were also important for the curious activity of promenading. Historian Amy Frost is walking me down George and Bath's most fashionable parade. They produce these sort of big pavements or promenades within which people can be seen to walk around in the latest fashions, doing the sort of fashionable things. And in fact, the parades that would build towards the river in the city of Bath gives them almost a theatre within which they can do this promenading. But there was a point to all this flagrant exhibitionism, as one of our best-loved authors well knew. Now, in her novels, Jane Austen, who, of course, was one of the most famous residents of Bath, talked not just about display, but also about the marriage market and, and was implying that Bath was a real centre for you know, contracting a, a valuable alliance. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, John Wood, when he builds the circus, says he, he, he builds it for the exhibition of sport. And he's not talking about gladiatorial games. He's talking about <laughs> um, sort of the sport of society, so it's a place right. to be seen. Mothers take out their eligible daughters to try and you know, marry them off to the most uh, eligible bachelor or... Um, men with titles but no money try and find the biggest heiress in the city to, to make their fortune. And it was very much a, a, a sort of marriage market. So Georgian Bath was a city built for pleasure, for showing off and for the very serious business of romance. Bath was one of the great economic and architectural successes of the late 18th century and very soon towns and cities up and down Britain wanted to imitate what it had achieved. 150 miles away in Buxton, the locals realised that mineral water alone would not a successful spa make. In 1780, they built a grand crescent of their own. In Bristol, the rich slave traders wanted smart homes like their Bath neighbours. Clifton Hill provided the ideal setting to combine architecture and nature, but even more dramatically. In York, the incredibly ambitious corporation decided to commission these spectacular assembly rooms. They took the whole notion of classical inspiration one step further because they were accurately based on an ancient Roman building. Very soon they became a social centre for the whole of North Yorkshire. The same sort of ambition, but on a much, much larger scale, led to an enormous new town planning project, but this time it was in Scotland. Founded in the 12th century, Scotland's capital city occupies a staggeringly beautiful site along the east coast. Today, it's easy to see why Edinburgh is often referred to as the Athens of the North. In my opinion, the view of Edinburgh Newtown from the castle is one of the finest in Britain. It is, in fact, the largest area of planned neoclassical townscape anywhere in Europe. And the question is, why was it built here? 
At the beginning of the 18th century, Scotland's once proud capital was in decline. For 650 years, Edinburgh effectively was a town that was a mile long and 300 yards wide. And you can see it there, snaking down the hill behind the castle. It was teeming with people in narrow streets and winding alleys. Over the years, towering tenement buildings had been extended upwards and outwards, filling every square foot of available land. And if overcrowding wasn't bad enough, Unification with the old enemy England had a devastating effect on Scotland's capital. When James VI of Scotland left Edinburgh to become James I of England, he took his royal court with him and closed down the royal palaces in Scotland. Just over a hundred years later, in 1707, the Act of Union meant the closure of the Scottish Parliament. These two events were a social and economic crisis for the city of Edinburgh. It was clear to the town's elite that the city had to develop in order to establish an equal partnership with London. In 1766, they announced a competition to find the best design for a new town outside the old city walls. A young man called James Craig came up with the winning designs for the layout of the new town. He was only 22. James Craig's first proposal for the layout of the new town was really very impractical. His idea was to lay out the streets and squares in the shape of a Union Jack. This slightly mad suggestion seems a little bit less so when you realise that his uncle was the man who wrote the words for Rule Britannia. In the end, he used the oldest of all town plans, the grid. But Craig's layout was a grid with a patriotic difference. He planned a central vista terminated by two churches, St Andrew's at one end and St George's at the other, and two town squares, again named after the patron saints of both nations. Craig created a sort of political diagram symbolising the equal partnership of Scotland and England united under the crown. The street that ran from one end to the other was predictably called George Street, after King George III. And the side streets told the same story. They were named Thistle and Rose, after each nation's flowers. Architect James Simpson is walking me through the new town that Craig planned. When you look at James Craig's plan on a piece of paper, it looks very boring, but it's not when you get on the site, is it? But that's the thing about great architecture in all periods and in all styles, Simon. It's not the plan that counts, it's the way it works and comes to life on the ground. Craig really understood the topography here. The fact that he set his great central streets on the ridge. You've got a spectacular view one way down towards the sea, and then here you've got an entirely different type of spectacular view. Absolutely. Looking back to the bustle and life in the old town with its tall 10 and 12 storey tenements. Wonderful urban design set piece. The new town blossomed, but James Craig's early promise was never fulfilled. The town plan was his sole triumph. He designed very few of the actual buildings. In fact, only one of his major buildings in Edinburgh remains, the old observatory on Carlton Hill. He died disillusioned and poor in 1795 and is buried in Greyfriars Churchyard. It was left to established architects like Robert Adam to make their mark on the buildings of the new town. Adam was the most famous architect of the day and at the height of his powers. He was Scottish, but had worked extensively in fashionable London. There had been little work in his native land until now. The construction of the, the new town and the, the public buildings, and this building, the Register House, was a huge architectural opportunity, and it was one of the things that drew Robert Adam back to practice in Scotland. Absolutely. The new town created a tremendous interest for him. He had already been commissioned to design one of the most important houses, Number 8 Queen Street. 
but the register house was the key building which was to open up the whole of the last part of his career in which the majority of his work was in Scotland. It must have been terribly important. I mean, it's hard to see today. Why? It represented one of the things which had survived under the Act of Union, the Scottish legal system. And this was a major public building, the first purpose-built archive building in the world, uh, which was designed to hold all the legal records of Scotland. Despite its grand public buildings, Edinburgh's new town didn't escape criticism. It had been built by different property speculators, and many people felt the townhouses lacked consistency. From this fantastic vantage point, you can see how owners of houses in George Street weren't obliged to adopt a single design. And what that meant was that a lot of the new town looked actually quite higgledy-piggledy. And so, in 1791, the town council commissioned Robert Adam to do something that was to be much more regular and much more splendid. It was Charlotte Square. Anna Kay is exploring one of the houses in Charlotte Square to find out just why the rich were so keen to move in. It must have been an extraordinary experience being among the first people to move into one of these fabulous Robert Adam town houses, having paid the princely sum of £1,800 for the privilege. But there were some pretty good reasons why the rich were soon deserting the old town for the new. Back in the old town, space was extremely limited. In buildings like this, the poor and rich lived cheek by jowl together. On the ground floors, the tradesmen, while the middle classes occupied the intermediate stories, up and away from the noise and smell of the open street. You see, sanitation was a real problem in the old town. The city had been built on a vast, rocky outcrop, and there were almost no sewers to take away the waste. In fact, on occasion, people were known to dispose of human waste out of the window. So, although many of the apartments here were very comfortable, it doesn't take much imagination to see why the rich might soon want to move out to the new town. In these grand terraced houses, the wealthy no longer had to live alongside the poor, except their own servants, of course, who spent most of their time below stairs. In Charlotte Square, the houses were of the typical upstairs-downstairs sort, with separate areas for the masters and their servants. The main service areas of the house, like this kitchen, were all below ground, with windows opening out into a basement cavity. There was also a separate entrance for the servants from the main street, so that unless they were required to, they need never enter their master's domain. A key feature of these Adam Town houses, a vital element in their classical composition, are sash windows. Sash windows were invented in the 1670s, but they were adopted enthusiastically throughout the towns and cities of Georgian Britain. In Edinburgh Old Town, traditional casement windows were common. Usually, the top half was made of glass and couldn't be opened, while in the bottom half, wooden shutters unlocked to let in the fresh air. In contrast, sash windows displayed large areas of glass and could be opened without breaking up the flat plane of the facade. When open, they provide increased ventilation by creating a natural convection current. Warm air rises and flows out from the top, while cool air enters through the bottom. Originally from Holland, the sash had a simple but brilliant opening mechanism, a weight and pulley system concealed inside the window frames. Two cast iron counterbalances, exactly as heavy as the window, allow it to hang weightlessly. Though a European import, the sash design soon became a craze in Britain, and it's remained virtually unchanged for 250 years. The sash window was so successful that it's still one of the most familiar features of our townscapes today. In the new town, interior design was also evolving. 
Now that people had the space, formal entertaining at home was becoming more popular and they paid a great deal of attention to fashionable modern decoration. And this is the dining room of the house on the ground floor. As you came in, the soup would have been placed on the table in its tureen and the wife, the hostess, would actually serve each guest individually and that would be a way of her showing off her social graces. And equally, the carving would have been done by the host and you'd even possibly have attended classes in how to carve elegantly as part of your gentlemanly education. So Ian, tell me about this wonderfully kind of elaborate layout we've got on the table in front of us. The formal pattern is, is built up of, firstly, this very grand Wedgwood dinner service. He was one of the first great mass market manufacturers who was bringing this kind of elegant living to the pockets of a much wider range of society. It's what's very special about the collection here is that what looks like silver is mainly, in fact, Sheffield plate. It's a slightly cheaper form um, made to look like silver. And again, rather like the Wedgwood dinner service, it's a way of making it easier for people at a slightly lower level of income to imitate the very grand table settings of the kind of 18th century aristocracy. So it's a sort of aspirational middle class aspirational, kind of... Well, this uh, is Edinburgh is very much a middle class city, but aiming to, to, to replicate the, the more of um, the grander, politer society. And now we come through into the formal drawing room of the house. So, Ian, this is, this is the sort of grand floor of the whole house, isn't it? Yes, sir. This would be called the Piano Nobile in architectural history, and that just means the noble floor, the, um, the grandest, if you like, in the house. And that's expressed externally as well. You're up where the columns are on the front of the facade, underlining that you're now in the kind of centre of the house where the main action will take place. This was a, a room for receptions and parties, and, and the new town was built um, for people to attend receptions, to go to court, to educate their children. So there was a lot of formal ed entertaining connected with these activities, and this would have been the centre of it, where you would have been introduced to your host and hostess. That's the point of moving to the new town, to show that you're joining in with this new, um, arguably more sophisticated um, way of life and um, enjoying the classical spirit of Adam's architecture. It took over 30 years to build Edinburgh's new town, and by 1800, the old town was starting to pay a heavy price. Edinburgh was becoming something of a schizophrenic city. The wealthy middle classes, the professional men, were moving out to the spacious squares of the new town. And as a result, the old town descended gradually into poverty and into crime. The dual nature of the city would be most chillingly expressed in a real life horror story. During the late 18th century, Edinburgh was in the throes of the Scottish Enlightenment. Huge advances were being made in philosophy, economics, science and medicine. Edinburgh's medical school was considered among the best in the world, but their growing understanding of human anatomy required dead bodies. Corpses were much in demand and grave robbing became commonplace. For the paupers who lived in the old town slums, ten pounds for each corpse they dug up was a huge fortune, and many well-heeled doctors from the new town kept paying up, no questions asked. The watchtower in St Cuthbert's graveyard lies just between the two Edinburghs, the old and the new. Watchtowers like this one were built to guard the graves and to stop the body snatchers. So the respectable new town may have been the polite face of Scotland's capital, but it was also a catalyst for the old city's decline. Crime and poverty have always been a feature of the urban environment, but in the 18th century, they threatened serious civil unrest. The social geography of our towns had changed. The rich now lived in smart new residential suburbs like Edinburgh Newtown and London's West End. The old parts of the cities were left to the poor, and the wealthy looked back at them with a distinct sense of unease. 
And well they might. Crime was so common that Parliament made more than 200 offences punishable by death. By 1800, London was the first city since ancient Rome to have a population of more than a million people. The rich now lived out in the west, but for the poor in the east, their capital city was a much more unforgiving place. The rich looked nervously across the channel to France, where just such a gulf had led to a bloody revolution. Anxious to avoid a similar calamity, the government proposed a solution. Build a lot of big churches. St James's in Bermondsey was part of their plan to keep the poor honest, upright and law-abiding. So in, in 1818, Parliament grants a million pounds for building new churches. It's a colossal sum of money. I mean, even today, a million pounds for building churches seems like a lot of money. The sum was really needed. There was a concern about um, sort of issues like morality. London traditionally was known for the London mob, and this could, a very sort of minor dispute, could suddenly escalate and there'd be sort of anarchy in various parts of, of the city. But the, in 1780, the Gordon riots really, things got very, very serious. I mean, basically the whole of the town got out of control and the troops had to be brought into the city. Now, London was very, very close to a sort of revolutionary situation. And these new churches were seen as an opportunity and the population was going to be, I suppose, calmed to actually downplay the threat of any kind of revolution. As London's population continued to grow, a hundred of these commissioner churches were built in its poorest areas. This is an incredibly good example of a commissioner's church. I mean, it is very grand, but you only have to look outside and you see the classic signs of it being one of these 1818 churches. It's built of brick and the sides are very, very, very plain. All the money's been thrown at the front to make as big a splash as possible. And it is enormous. The drive was to fit as many people as you could into the church. And this one, we know, um, I think there were 2,000 people could sit in this church. Incredible number. The visibility of the churches was something that was quite new. A lot of them are quite tall buildings. These towers were quite spectacular. You can see even today it's quite a sizeable church. It stands out still. The commissioner churches were the most visible symbol of the government's determination to assert control. But religion was only one tool. There followed workhouses and hospitals. London was the first city to develop a police force and police stations, and it was soon to have reforming prisons as well. The state was beginning to create an architectural infrastructure of control. The aim was to enable a million people to live together in relative peace. But population explosion was not the only side effect of London's boom time. An explosion in trade was causing problems too. London was now the centre of the world, the heart of an enormous global empire. Foreign trade had made the city extremely rich but its port was a victim of its own success. In a period of about 100 years, the tonnage of shipping coming into London had trebled. Overseas trade was now worth £50 million a year. That's something like £2.5 billion a year in today's money. And this area of the Thames, known as the Pool of London, was crammed full of shipping. There was no architectural infrastructure, and by the late 18th century, the scene here was one of total chaos. The situation was so bad that 1,800 vessels were forced to moor in a space suitable for just 500. Ships often had to stop downriver and transfer their cargoes into small boats which would carry them into town. By the 1790s, London's merchants were worried about a loss in profits and pressing for change. 
And the result was the West India docks, at the time the world's largest built structure. They drastically reduced cargo handling time from four weeks to four days. An integral part of the dock was these warehouses, one of which now appropriately houses the museum in Docklands. But they originally ran a mile in that direction and formed a magnificent architectural backdrop to Britain's emerging trade empire. In the years that followed, docks sprang up all over East London. They were hugely successful, hives of international trade, carving out and disciplining the land adjacent to the Thames. They also created a series of new communities. This was the beginning of the proud and respectable working class East End. After the restoration, property developers in London built elegant towns and squares that created a look that went on to be imitated across the country. 150 years later, it was the government's turn to act. Prompted by fears about unrest amongst the urban poor, they created an architectural infrastructure that went on to inform the way towns and cities were planned in the future. The blueprint of the modern British city had been drawn. Next time, I set out to discover how we created the great British landscape and how the countryside revolution gave birth to the farmstead and the market town. <laughs>